I do love a good paradox. King James II, a king who grew up fighting for his kingdom's enemies, the head of a religion he didn't believe in, a husband who fought tooth and nail for his wife while openly sleeping around, and a tyrant whose people hated him because he wasn't oppressing them enough. James II was the second son of King Charles I and raised in what you might call a broken home. King Charles was constantly looking for ways to rule England without the cooperation of Parliament and was widely hated for making the English church slightly Catholic-y. Hold on to that thought, it's gonna be important. Things finally reached a breaking point in 1642. Pack your bags, kids, we've gotta go! Parliament's kicking us out. But you're the king! I, I thought Parliament loved you. Daddy and Parliament love each other very much. We're just going through a rough patch right now, so we're gonna spend some time apart. And so the English Civil War began. Charles was captured, and then he made a deal with Scotland to start a second civil war against England. He lost again, and then his head started spending some time apart from his shoulders. England decides to be a republic. Scotland and Ireland aren't too sure about that. They invite James's older brother Charles II to become king. England says, oh no you don't, and starts a third civil war. Check it out, Civil War 3! How's it going? It's just like the first two! Charles and James made like a bougie teen on gap year trying to find themselves and ran to France as fast as possible. There they were welcomed by the French king, Louis XIV. I just, I don't do kids. I don't want their grubby little fingers running through the portrait gallery. There must be something you can do with them. Hey kiddos! Wow, we have so much in common! I'm also fighting a war against a parliament that thinks the king shouldn't have unlimited power. Lend a hand, would ya? James serves in the French army and gets promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General, no doubt using his nifty new uniform and royal heritage to make inroads with the ladies. James was a prodigious womanizer and, quote, the most unguarded ogler of his time, though apparently his taste in partners was unique. As one historian quipped, his mistresses must have been given to him by a priest as penance. Things are looking up when James returns to Paris. You've got a lot of nerve showing up here! What? Don't play games with me! What, just because we allied ourselves with the men who killed your father, suddenly your brother thinks he's too good for France, huh? You allied with Cromwell? But then, to cozy up to Spain? After all I've done for you. Get out of my sight! James argues with Charles, wishing he hadn't made the call to uproot and move to Spain, but James is still going to support his brother no matter what. After all, the two of them, all they've got left is each other and a royal entourage, and lots of money, and connections to royalty across the continent, and each other. James takes a post in the Spanish military and does even better for himself than he did in France. In fact, the Spanish king offers James the chance to start a new life and take up command as an admiral of the Spanish navy. It's everything a man could ask for. Wealth, fame, power, ladies. The king of Spain tells him the situation in England doesn't bear thinking about. It's impossible for Charles to defeat Cromwell's new model army. And James agrees, the situation is hopeless. But Charles thinks it'll work itself out. So, James is gonna stick with his brother. And Spain was right, Charles never did defeat the new model army. Something much more interesting happened. When Cromwell died, the newly elected parliament was made up mostly of moderates and people who kinda sorta want the king to come back. But the army continues to be the real force in charge of the country. One commander, named Lambert, seems to be preparing to install a new military lord protector, but another commander, named Monk, has aligned himself with public sentiment. Monk defeats Lambert, comes into Parliament, and says, This, this clearly isn't working. It's anarchy. I've got a new plan. Congratulations. You are hereby named King of England. What can I say? Sometimes these things just work themselves out. Charles II takes up the mantle of king and everything pretty much goes back to normal. But now it was James's turn to cause his brother headaches. It seems like every time James was brought to the king's attention, it was never good news. 
First of all, he'd been flirting with one of his retainer's daughters, a girl from a significantly lower social class, and displaying far, far too much affection for the 17th century. They're being all playful and flirty, and James might have promised to marry her, and uh, she was already pregnant. And James refuses to have any children outside of wedlock until after he's married. She says yes, everyone is shocked and appalled, the girl's own father goes to the king and asks him to execute her, it'd just be easier that way and we can all just move on. But James wants the marriage and Charles is going to stand by his brother, and also not wantonly murder a woman. And then after that cute little love story, he goes around having affairs with who knows how many women and had something like seven kids outside of wedlock, but nothing compared to an announcement he made in 1673. Everyone, I think the news is bound to reach you soon, so I'd rather you hear it from myself. It may come as a shock to you, but I want you to know it's okay. I've felt this way for a long time. It's who I am, and I'm not going to hide it anymore. I'm a Catholic. No! So it turns out, when you spend most of your adolescence in Catholic countries, there is a slight risk of contracting Catholicism. James had gotten close to a couple of Irish Catholic advisors when he was young, and in 1668 he went to a secret mass for his first communion. Funny to imagine him shamefully eating wafers in the shadows like some kind of dark cabal. The only person to support him in this time? His wife. She was into it too. Say goodbye to her though, because she died in 1671. James moved into his fifth decade alone, and though he knew no one could ever fill the hole his wife left in his heart, he could at least shag a 15-year-old child. Now James could have gone on in the closet all his life had it not been for our good friends in Parliament. Parliament had watched in 1562 when France burned itself to the ground over religion, and then in 1618 when all of Europe burned itself to the ground over religion, and then in 1642 when Britain burned itself to the ground over religion, and they thought to themselves, you know what the problem with this country is? Too many rights. So in 1661, after fighting a civil war alongside the Presbyterians, they banned them from holding public office. And there was much rejoicing. Then in 1664, they made all non-Anglican religious meetings punishable by fines and imprisonment, and there was much rejoicing. Then in 1673, they decided to ban everyone other than Orthodox Anglicans from serving in the military or public office, and there was much rejoicing. All civil and military officers were required to denounce Catholic practices as heathenous idolatry, and that was when James opted to relinquish his position as admiral. His brother Charles is furious, and orders that James had better not pass on any of that Catholic crap to his daughters, because Charles was having a hard time coming up with any legitimate heirs, and it was looking increasingly likely that James would be the next king. A Catholic king is bad enough, but a Catholic dynasty? No way, Jose. And if Charles was mad, Oh, you better believe Parliament was livid. They decree that James is no longer eligible for the crown and- Oh, that's weird. No, no, they just dissolved. Well, they meet again, and James is no longer- No, they dissolved again. How about the next year? No? That's weird. I wonder why they- Oh, it's Charles! You know, your father got into a lot of trouble trying to cheat his way around Parliament. And look how well you fared without him. My father was delivered to paradise. It seems to me you were left in a lot more trouble than him. James, I cannot keep dissolving Parliament to cover for you. I swear to God they're going to murder me. I'm not going to convert if that's what you're asking. What? No, I don't care about that. Hell, I promised to become Catholic years ago. I'll pay you to stay out of the war. Sweet, no problem. I'll pay you more if you attack the Netherlands. <laughs> nice. And you have to become Catholic. Well, okay. You just need to get out of the country and lay low. They'll forget all about you. James takes his brother's advice, which was actually an order, and kicks back in Brussels for a while, then pops in to visit Scotland and put down a rebellion because technically he was only kicked out of England, and Scotland isn't in England, ha ha ha. And then eventually, someone tries to kill both brothers, which means James is suddenly sympathetic and therefore popular again, and Charles uses it as the perfect excuse to suppress dissent in Parliament and install his brother on the King's Privy Council. Council. Bada bing bada boom. Lucky timing because pretty soon Charles dies of a stroke, still no legitimate children, and James takes the crown. James tells Parliament, Look, let's try to make this as orderly as we can. I don't care if you voted to exclude me from the line of succession, just as long as you're not plotting to oust me, alright? 
Immediately, two rebellions break out. James puts them down without too much trouble, but it's weird that both of those rebellions led by English nobles were initially planned and staged in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands leader, Prince William of Orange, who was, by the way, married to one of James's daughters, he didn't seem to mention anything about either rebellion. Well, just to be safe, James wants to expand the army. And hey, the easiest way to do it is to let Catholics back in. And so that's what he did. He didn't find a loophole, he didn't repeal the law, he just did it. And the court decided that, yeah, laws are more like guidelines, really. I can't believe we didn't think of that. We can still cut his funding. Oh no you don't. Hey, you better not be about to dissolve Parliament or you're in a lot of trouble, mister. Me? No! I'm not dissolving you, I'm proroguing you. I'm gonna put you on pause. Oh. Indefinitely. Ah! Technicalities! My only weakness! James made it his mission to push back on England's anti-Catholic laws. He provided exceptions and pardons to allow Catholics to live their lives in peace, but he knew he needed to win the hearts and minds of the English people. He appealed to their intellect, before Charles II converted on his deathbed, he made some notes about why Catholicism was way cooler than Anglicanism. James published these notes and challenged the Church of England to debate him. No one did. So he appealed to the people's common decency. He toured the country to speak to the common man and tell him, Can't you see? We have as little reason to quarrel with other men for having different opinions as for having different skin color. Imagine if we passed a law that imprisoned all black men and forced them into hard labor. Okay, bad example. Then suddenly, James remembered he's not just a Catholic, he's also the head of the Church of England. So he orders Anglican priests to preach religious tolerance. Yeah, you know how the King of England doesn't make the rules in England anymore? I'm guessing this is why he doesn't make the rules in the Church of England anymore, either. The only reason the people of England put up with their disgraceful king and his sickening message of loving their neighbors was because he'd be dead soon, and both his daughters were Anglican. And then, the best and worst day of James' life happens. He has a son. A son who was first in line to the crown. A son who would be raised Catholic. Panic across England! The king has a son! He has a son, and he's going to be king, and he's going to be Catholic! The king of England is going to be Catholic forever! Parliament tells King James, F*** you! We'd rather be occupied by a foreign army than lent to freedom by a Catholic! And so they invited a foreign army to occupy Britain. Remember William of Orange? He's married to one of James's daughters, and he's coming to London. Well, James catches wind that an invasion is coming. Louis XIV of France offers to help, but James turns him down because 9 out of 10 dentists recommend not recruiting a foreign army to make war against your own people. Think of the optics. Parliament is recruiting a foreign power to topple the government and install the leader of the Netherlands as King of England. As long as James doesn't stoop to their level, he is the honorable Brit defending the homeland. It just so happens that William of Orange was the 10th dentist, because James's military commanders and his own daughters abandon him immediately. And the people of England are ecstatic. This is wild to me. I've made a lot of videos about crazy rulers making dumb and arbitrary decisions, but I don't think I have ever seen a situation where the king is sane and the crazy person is the entire English public. And it's especially wild because there was a reason to hate James. In Scotland, Mr. Religious Equality passed an act taking England's religious laws and dialing them up to 11. In the same year, he shut down Parliament for not allowing Catholics into the army. He made a law that anyone in Scotland who attends a Presbyterian church service shall be put to death and his belongings confiscated by the state. But no, England's the one that wants a new king. Seriously, this is the equivalent of America deciding that Muslims have too many rights, so they call up Xi Jinping to ask if he'll come to the White House and set up some more concentration camps. James escapes in the dead of night, only to be captured and brought back to William. But William doesn't want to turn James into a martyr, so he has to get him out of the country discreetly. Well, here we are. Oh, shoot. I've got to take a whiz. Would, would you mind holding this for me? Ah, what a beautiful moonless night. And calm, too. I bet you could make it all the way to France on a night like this. And that's how James ended up reconnecting with an old friend. I didn't even know we had a bowling alley. Oh, hey, long time no see. 
I mean, it's just inhumane! You think you've got it bad? William of Orange has been a thorn in my side for years. I'm at war with him right now. He's a total bully. Not like you. You were always good. You're at war with him right now. I'm at war with everyone right now. So you could use an ally. Go on. I still have support in Ireland and Scotland. Scotland? Really? If William were busy fighting an uprising in Ireland, he couldn't send as many men to fight you on the continent. If you can spare the troops, all I need is a head start to light that powder keg. It's a close war, but James and Louis are never able to get a permanent hold of Ireland. The Irish never forgave James for leaving them behind, and with tear-stained eyes gave him the name James the Sh. Well, if you want, I could make you the King of Poland. I want to tell you something. When I left here as a boy and traveled to Spain, I had a chance to give up. I wanted to give up, to start a new life. But my brother taught me an important lesson. Britain was the land of my father and his father, and maybe it won't be me. Maybe it won't be my son. But one day, there is going to be a Stuart on the throne of England, because Stuarts never give up. Because sometimes, life hands you what you want. Great, my conscience is clear. That's a no from James on Poland. What if we had an inside man in Saxony? England invited my family to be kings twice already. I don't care how long it takes. We will continue to declare war on them until they come to their senses and invite us back again. James and his son and his sons after him would spend their lives fighting for the throne, fighting for the land that was promised to them, until they failed enough times that France and even the Pope got too embarrassed to keep them around. James II was buried in France, never to be returned to England.